and the scripture reading is Matthew 5, 1 through 11. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil things against you because of me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> Would you bow with me for prayer, please? Father, with the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So, one of the things that I spend probably too much time on, oh my man, or too much, I spend a lot of time on, is, and it's hard to say this, just not embarrassing my wife in public. Don't you say it? Okay, um, there's a couple of things. Uh, let's just say there's things that I've done that have embarrassed her uh, when we were together. Um, we were at CrossFit one time back before the kids were born, uh, and uh, uh, there's an element of competition in CrossFit. So I decided that one time I was just going to outdo this other guy, and needless to say, I got a little bit overheated, and uh, I didn't vomit, but I almost did. Um, the CrossFit guy was like, yeah, all right. Uh, my wife was not that way. Uh, she, in the car, was like, I cannot believe that uh, I'm married to the person who almost vomited at CrossFit. I lost my name. Now I was just the guy she was married to. Um, the other time, and this is more recent, um, and this actually has happened since I've come here to, to Northern Hills, um, I just, just had an eyebrow that had kind of thought it owned the place. Um, so I began to kind of trim it up, and the guard falls off, and I don't react as quickly as I should have or could have, maybe, I don't know. Um, but anyway, I had an eyelash that was thin, kind of through the middle. You might have noticed, she did, let's just say that, um, was less than pleased uh, with me, kind of gave me an eye roll, and, uh, uh, and actually she uh, licked her finger and kind of like tried to fix it. It didn't work. Um, but those are just two instances of times where I have uh, embarrassed her um, in public. But there's one that's reoccurring, and there's nothing I can do about it. And it's real simple. I sneeze big. I mean big. Like, like ostentatiously big. It annoys her. And I keep talking, Stephanie, I don't control the way I sneeze it just happens. It was something I was born with. I don't know if she believes me or not. Um, but I can tell you that the first time I sneezed over at the offices, two things happened. One, people came to my office to make sure that I was okay. And then they left laughing when they realized I had been sneezing. Um, because apparently things uh, as far away as Pash Lupina's office on the other side were shaking uh, on the wall. Uh, it's just a production. It's big. Um, and it never just happens once. I'm not a lone sneezer, you know? You know the person, like maybe 15% of uh, the population can sneeze once and be done with it? That's not me. No. Like it's a cacophony of sneezes that get big and big and big and then culminate with a very loud final sneeze. Now, the question is, and this is what I want to take your guys' uh, poll on, 85% of the people, I think, in our population are the multiple sneeze people, right? Sneeze, 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 sneeze. Is it one bless you, or is it a bless you for every sneeze? Okay, okay, I, I, want, I want to know this. Okay, how many of you are each sneeze deserves its own bless you? Let me see it. Okay. Now, how many of you are like, no, 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 I'm more economic with my bless yous. It's all the sneezes get one bless you. Okay. 
I, th I think we have quorum on that side. Okay. Um, just so you know, if you're a multiple bless you person, uh, I understand you. Uh, I, I, I don't disagree with you, but the one bless you's have it because obviously their bless you's mean more, right? They're giving less of them, right? I give you one bless you. That means uh, my bless you's are bigger than your multiple bless you. No, no, you don't agree with me? No, no, no. My bless you's are just as potent as your one big bless you. Whatever, whatever you believe, I can tell you this. Um, blessings have lost what they were. Like, uh, you know, to us, we think of a bless you as a courtesy, right? It's, it's, a, it's a customary. Of course, the, the reason we do that is interesting. In the Middle Ages, they believed that when people sneezed, that evil spirits were leaving them. So you said bless you so that that evil spirit wouldn't go back in. Uh, and if you're German, it's Gesundheit, apparently. Um, and even then, like, it didn't mean as much. The farther back we go in biblical time, it seems like blessings mean more and more and more. The first blessing uh, came on the fifth day of creation. Uh, it was the Lord blessing the birds of the air and the fish of the seas and asking them to multiply and fill the earth. Those blessings continued throughout other Old Testament figures and transcend all the way to Revelations. In fact, uh, blessings are probably one of the very few things that we can see biblically that started from the very beginning and go all the way to the end. What they mean is slightly different and changing, but blessings have transcended time. Now, in the Old Testament, blessings meant something. We see uh, the, the blessings of, uh, in, in Genesis where God is blessing things and they're multiplying. He continues to do that until he gets to Abraham. Abraham, he gives a blessing that he will be, his descendants will be like the stars or the sands, but then he adds one, that all of creation will be blessed through Abraham. Now, my favorite Old Testament blessing happens two generations later with Jacob and Esau. Isaac, by this time, is an old guy. He is blind. And Jacob, who really hasn't kind of met the Lord yet, is crafty. He sells, I mean, excuse me, he buys his brother's blessing. Or excuse me, he buys his brother's birthright for a bowl of soup. And then later on, he steals his brother's blessing from his father. And if you guys don't remember the story, he puts uh, animal skins on his arms because his brother was much more hairy. I don't know if he had eyebrows like mine, but we'll see uh, someday uh, in heaven. Um, but even then, he puts animal skins on things and he goes in and asks for the blessings of his father and he gets them. Esau is livid. Goes in to Isaac and asks for, well, bless me too, Dad. And Isaac says, no. I can't give to you what I've already given away because in the Old Testament, this blessing was not just a wishing of good fortune. It was a transference of leadership and power and authority in the family. Isaac couldn't give it away. They thought that blessings and even words in general were living things that could not be undone. As we go forward in the Old Testament, blessings continue to happen and then we get to the New Testament. And the first and best example of blessings in the New Testament really happens with Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount early in his ministry. Matthew 5. He just started. And he gets up and he sees these people. He has compassion on them. And he starts teaching them. And he talks about blessings. Now the idea in blessings in the New Testament is different. Bless you. All right, there we go. All right, sermon examples. Okay, I appreciate you. We timed that a long time ago. Okay. Um, <laughs> do I lost my train of thought now? All right, okay. Um, the idea of blessings in the New Testament are different than the old. Uh, you see, in the New Testament, they're translated by this word, uh, makarios. Uh, makarios, uh, you might notice something. Uh, the first couple letters is Mac. Mac, uh, and a lot of times in our language, stands for large, like macroeconomics or a mac 
truck for big. So the idea of blessings in the New Testament or makarios means to make bigger or to magnify. That's the idea that we have when we come uh, to the Beatitudes that Jesus is talking about, that he is going to magnify those folks. He's going to make them bigger, make them more blessed, make them larger. And so as we go into these Beatitudes, understand that Christ is highlighting things. Things that might have gone, as Pastor Abel said, unnoticed in that society and in that culture. Now, the other thing, before we even jump into the details of all these, and we're only going to cover three today, is that the idea that I disagree with some of the ways we read these blessings. Because they're not declarative statements. They're actually exclamations and sounds of celebration. So instead of saying, blessed are the peacemakers, blessed are the meek, you can say, how blessed are the peacemakers? How blessed are the meek? How blessed are those that hunger and thirst for righteousness? When we say it like that, it has that emotion, that power. And I believe that Jesus added those things into when he was talking. About. You don't get on the Sermon on the Mount and say, blessed are the meek. No, that's just not the way you do it. He would, he would get up big and say, blessed are the meek. Or how blessed are the meek. And so as we go through, I might be adding in that exclamation point. Understand that I'm doing so semi-intentionally. So as I said, we're going to talk about three of the Beatitudes today. We're going to cover the first one, the second one, and the fourth one. We could do a deep dive on all of them. We could do sermon series on Beatitudes that last years. You guys, but we're not going to do that. We're just going to cover three. So the first one that we're going to cover is this. Blessed are the poor in spirit. And I have to say, on first reading of this one, I don't like it. I'm a pastor. My job, uh, it feels like I should be strong in spirit. Like, it's my job. I, I, I am uh, th- this person who makes my living by understanding and living in the spirit. Why, why can't I be strong? Why shouldn't I be strong? And I think about uh, my pastoral mentors and the, and the guys at the churches I grew up with um, who led me in ways, and they all seemed so amazingly strong in spirit. I feel like nothing would faze them. They could get into any situation and just the Lord would just shine through them. And as I was thinking about it this week, I realized that was the key. That these these mentors of mine were strong in spirit or appeared strong in spirit, not because they were strong, but because they were weak in spirit. And what they lacked the Lord filled up. And we just got done with this fulfilled sermon series, this uh, whole grouping of Old Testament figures who the Lord poured into so that they could pour out to people. And the thing that I, I never said, but I realized I should have during that entire sermon series, is that the Lord loves to make those who appear weak strong. Think about Moses before he interacted with the burning bush and God. He was a man who was terrified by himself, running from his past. He said that he was slow of word and speech, and even basically just asked God, who am I that I can do this? But the Lord poured into him. His weaknesses were made strong by the Lord. He was weak in spirit, but the Lord made him strong. Think of Gideon, who was afraid to lead his own men but then the Lord poured into him and he was able to defeat the enemies of the Lord. Think of Ruth, a foreigner in the Holy Land. Think of Esther, the queen who could have been killed by her own husband, but still went and ended up saving her people. The Lord loves to make the strong, I mean, excuse me, make the weak into strong, and that's what poor in spirit means that our spirit is less so that the Lord can fill us up more and more and more so those who appear strong in spirit are actually the poorest in spirit. Now, I'm, a, I'm a semi-fan of Martin Luther. I like a lot of his writings. I like some of the Reformation work he is, but by all accounts when I read him, that this guy was really mean. 
But when he died, there was a piece of paper found in his pocket. Apparently, he carried it with him everywhere. And this piece of paper said these words, It is true. We are all beggars. Martin Luther understood the idea of being poor in spirit led to boldness of yourself by the Lord. And of course, the ultimate example of poor in spirit came three years after Jesus said these words when he went on the cross, that symbol of pain and shame. But the Lord went humbly to it, poor in spirit, the made by, mighty by the Lord. Poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Our second beatitude is right after that. For those who are, blessed are those who are poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. In our society, just like blessings, we don't have any systematic process of mourning. Each of us mourn how we want. I was trying to think about mourning this week, um, about if I do, if I, if I mourn at all. And I think mourning is different than sadness. I think I, I'm, I'm sad um, occasionally, but I think when it comes to mourning, it's the idea that I regret having done things I shouldn't or regret having not done things I should. I'm never in mourning because I messed up trimming my eyebrows, but I am in mourning when I don't tell Stephanie how much I value her. I am in mourning when my grandfather passed on when I was 19, but I didn't tell him exactly what he meant to me. The idea of mourning can take two-fold approach. One, that we are sad because we didn't say what we could, or we're sad because those who have gone to death before us have now left and we do not see them again in order to express our emotions. The amazing thing is, is that when it comes to mourning, and when it comes to the kingdom of heaven, both those problems are solved by the idea of heaven. Imagine a place where time doesn't exist, where pain has lost its hurt, and where death has no sting. And for those that have gone before us in love are with us one more time. In a place like that, mourning has no presence. Joy has replaced it. Comfort has replaced it. So how blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Now we're skipping meekness and going straight to this one. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. And what, what can I say? What observations can I make about this? Almost, almost nothing. The only thing that I can think about this is hunger and thirst. Well, I'm hungry and I'm thirsty every day. Sometimes multiple times a day. I'm wondering in my own life, Every day, am I seeking righteousness like that? You guys know how many times I talk about food and how food is very important to me. It shows, I know that. But the idea that I'm searching for righteousness in my own life as much as I think about lunch or supper would change my life in ways I can't even imagine. So the idea of those who hunger and thirst for righteousness will be filled. You can just go. That's one of the things I love about the Beatitudes. Is as I said before, we can go a deep dive. We can talk about uh, the Beatitudes, the nuances of the language. Um, I think that these Beatitudes are kind of amazing because almost buried in their wording are keys to unlocking them, kind of like uh, those word problems you used to have in elementary school, where the answer's somewhere in there, you just have to find it. I think the Beatitudes are the same way. You can unlock secrets that the Lord put in there. You can understand some of the wording and how much amazing depth He put in these. But that's just as powerful as the simple question. 
Am I hunger? Am I hungry and thirsty for righteousness? Am I meek? Am I a peacemaker? Do I mourn? Those questions can be just as powerful to us as the deep dive questions. The Beatitudes are a prime example that Christ knows us better than we know ourselves because he was able to give us these simple statements that connect with us on a very immediate level but also allow us to go deep dive into his theology and into what he believes as the kingdom of heaven. As I was doing research this week, I came across something. And I wouldn't call them uh, even close to Beatitudes. They're just something I found on the internet. But as soon as I read them, I liked them enough that I wanted to share them with you. And we'll close with this. I asked God to take away my pain. And God said, no, it is not for me to take away, but for you to give it up. I asked God to grant me patience, and God said, no. Patience is a byproduct of tribulations. It isn't granted. It is earned. I asked God to give me happiness, and God said, no, I give you blessing. Happiness is up to you. I asked God to spare me pain, and God said, no. Suffering draws you apart from worldly cares and brings you closer to me. I asked God to make my spirit grow, and God said, no. You must grow your own, but I will prune you to make you fruitful. I asked God for all things that I might enjoy life, and God said, no. I give you life so you may enjoy all things. And I asked God to help me love others as much as he loves me. And God said, finally, you have the idea. Would you pray with me?